of what I find is when I'm being observed, it, it really disrupts things. It's so artificial. Teaching is about trust. Education these days is, a, is about delivery systems. It's about the marketplace. It's, a, it, it, it's about the private sector. It's about the appearance of quality without quality itself. The relentless, relentless drive for ever higher results. The union hasn't delivered properly for the membership. The people who understand the service the best are the people who deliver it. And increasingly, by and large, the head teachers aren't involved in the whole thing. My life as a teacher. Part three in the four part well read film series on work. Could you please start off, Matthew, by telling us a little bit about your job as a teacher and who your students are? Well, David, I teach uh, history and sociology to 11 to 18 year olds. Mm -hmm. I teach in a mixed comprehensive in a former mining community. The kids are largely working class and of all academic abilities, shall we say. I retire next summer, 2017. I'll be 37 years in the job. Yeah, I know. I don't want to miss it. I mean, massively so. so. What have you liked about the job? What What's given you most satisfaction? Well, the job is unique in its own way. Um, and I had plenty of jobs before I went into teaching. On its day, if you're allowed to teach, if you're allowed to develop the process of teaching, that vital interaction, the rapport with the children, Few jobs can match it for satisfaction. Why? 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 Well, let's look at it this way. I teach history and sociology and I love my subjects. I really do. I adore them. It's about ideas and I'm interested in ideas. Mm. I'm interested in generating that thing. I'm also interested in the children's feedback. I love it when they get it. I love it when they share their ideas, their unique way of looking at the world, okay. That's all about communication, about expression, about points of view and debating points. Now, I might not always agree with what they say, but if they are coming up with something, then that's important. But sometimes I get home in the evening, and I think to myself, I made a difference today, and that is really important. What do you think it means to be a, quote, good teacher? Good teacher, let me see. Well, firstly, I don't really think there are any such thing as a good teacher. When I, when I came into the job in 1980, I, I probably had my own fixed idea of what a good teacher was, okay? And that was based on my politics, it was based on my liberal ideas, my left-wing views. But I wasn't, I knew, I wasn't into disciplining the children in a, in a kind of military, army-style fashion. As I got into it, I discovered it, it's about you. It's about your personality, what you bring to the job. You can't be straight-jacketed. You have to develop and express your personality. You can't mould a teacher into being the ideal teacher. So, for to your earlier point, I'd, I'd say there is no such thing as an ideal, perfect teacher. But you really like teaching. Oh, God, yeah. I love teaching. I mean, I've never stopped. I, I love it. I mean, for example, I, I, I taught all day, um, all day, didn't have any freeze. I love what I was doing and the kids loved what I was doing. But I know that there are a lot of teachers these days that are quite dissatisfied. Uh, I read a poll the other day that says that 50% uh, that of teachers are looking at quitting the profession within the next two years and that two thirds say that morale has declined over the last five years and, and only 10% say that morale mm, has improved. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, where do these numbers come from? Well, statistics speak for themselves and it, and it is a tragedy. Um, look, teaching is a profession and the government are currently desperately trying to undermine it as a profession, which is a tragedy. Mm. Teaching is about it's about the process of teaching. It's about learning the vital interaction, 
and you don't get that you don't get that place overnight it's about it's about the process of training and learning on the job learning on the job that's vital you need time to do that the academization process is seriously undermining the profession of teaching and that approach to teaching and undermining schools and, and education generally but so did the Tories so-called great education reform act of 1988 and it's been getting steadily worse ever since when i first came into teaching and for the first 15 years of my career from 1980 to 1995 my colleagues and i we had more or less um, total control over the, what we were doing we were autonomous we were allowed to do what we wanted now this didn't impact on the children they you know as long as we're doing what was necessary and being professional about it they succeeded we weren't going to let them down badly not at all because we believed in what we were doing but since 1995 our level of control has been greatly reduced and it's been speeding up year by year ever since well can you give us an example of this loss of control this this deprofessionalization of teaching well for example the the necessity for classroom planning, the obsession with classroom planning. Um, now you have to have your your lesson organised, so that if Ofsted come in or a head teacher or uh, another colleague, you have to be able to demonstrate that your pupil has made progress within a sixty minute block of time. Education doesn't work like that. It's it's, it's a linear process. Yes, a pupil might have a eureka moment but generally it's about bringing pupils of different abilities to a certain point at certain times it's about quantitative changes leading to qualitative breakthroughs so how does classroom observation fit into this well f what i find is when i'm being observed it, it really disrupts things it's so artificial teaching is about trust it's about building relationships it's an organic process and without that atmosphere without that structure the learning process simply won't thrive now when you have what i increasingly call the the straight jacket approach all creativity is stifled it's stymied nothing happens they, they talk about creativity and um, Let's use a sporting analogy. When you go into the zone, well, it's exactly the same in teaching. You can go into the zone there. Mm. And what do, what role do the pupils play? That? Well, the pupils are vital. W without them, you can't step up to the next level. Teaching is about it's about acting, but it's about acting with a purpose. It's about acting in order to engage the pupils. Mm. That is the vital thing. And when a class is over, the pupils will come and see me and say, Sir, thank you, that was a really great lesson. Sometimes there'll be kids I haven't taught for three or four years and they'll say, Sir, how are you getting on? I really enjoyed your lesson. And you know what? When I do finally retire, I'm really going to miss that. So what, what is life like in the classroom nowadays, and especially for new teachers? Well... I'm not going to say, I don't, I don't want to be too cynical about it, but education these days is, a, is about delivery systems. It's about the marketplace. It's, a, it, it, it's about the private sector. Unfortunately, it's about producing a product. So correspondingly, you, you get children with X number of uh, GCSEs or A-levels, and it's, it's akin to producing 10 workable phones. And academies are a big part of this. <laughs> now, now, because I'm an experienced teacher, I can tell you how long I've been doing it, because I've got the nous, unlike the new teachers, I, I, I can see through what I loosely call the bullshit. But if you're a new teacher and you don't know anything different, you're expected to produce all these results. You're supposed to, or required to, have your children, you know, reaching set levels and within those 60 minute formats. For example, you've, you've got 15 different classes, 30 pupils. That's a huge workload and that's, that's a big burden for the, the, the new young teachers to keep producing these statistics, these data. And additionally, 
you've got planning at home, you've got parents' evenings, all the admin, all the bureaucracy. It's a tremendous workload. And my conclusion is that it's becoming burdensome and top-heavy. And really, the academies aren't helping one little bit in this whole process. It's Fordism. So what is Fordism? Fordism. Well, you, you might or might know, not know. Fordism is a... It was an industrial technique that Henry Ford, the car manufacturer, introduced uh, in America over a century ago. Basically, on an assembly line, you produce X number of identical cars. And this is analogous to what I feel is going on in teaching now. Mm. And in my view, it's, it's leading a lot of teachers to want to leave teaching. When I started, I'm not saying it's a job for life, but I knew I wanted to be a teacher. And my colleagues and I at the time, we, we liked, we really enjoyed teaching. We wouldn't have left unless it was for a really, really good reason. Uh, I'm accepting that, you know, people will start a career and they'll have made a mistake. That's fair enough. But by and large, people wanted to stay in the job. But what's happening today is, is, is terrible. It's, it's about, it's about uncaring management. It's about government that doesn't really believe in the processes of education. It's about the appearance of quality without quality itself. The relentless, relentless drive for ever higher results. And this grey grind, this relentless grey grind is what's leading teachers of all ages to leave the profession. It's very sad in my opinion. Mm. Now you're a, you're a long time activist with the National Union of Teachers. I mean, I don't have to ask whether you think a union is needed for teaching. Yeah. Well, of course not. I mean, I would say the need for a union has been ever present, but I'd say it's there now more than ever. So how have things changed in the NUT, in your school, over the years? I know it's not the case, but trade unionism should be about, well, who controls the workplace. The best workplaces are the workplaces that are controlled by the workers in consultation with, you know, whoever uses a service, if it is a service. When I came into the profession in the 1980s, which seems like quite a long time ago now, we had national pay and conditions. And also we didn't have anything like the current interference we, we have in the profession. At our school, in a strange kind of way, we the workers, the staff, the trade union, we, we controlled the workplace. If we had a problem, we would see the head teacher and we would sort it out. We'd say, we don't want this. What, what happened then? <laughs> Let's say, we, we'd go and say, no. Bill, the headmaster, yeah. the head teacher, we would say, Bill, we don't like this. This isn't effective. This isn't going to work and we don't want it. Now, he, he would argue with us a little bit and eventually he'd see our point of view and... Uh, We'd say it isn't going to happen. Lo and behold, it didn't happen. The people who understand the service the best are the people who deliver it. And increasingly, by and large, the head teachers aren't involved in the whole thing. The further you are away from the workplace, the less you should be able to influence it. And this applies to the politicians like Justine Green and Theresa May and her new strategy to introduce grammar schools. They should really not be involved. What about the NUT nationally? I'm often frustrated by my work in the union. Um, and I feel we've been let down in times. The union hasn't delivered properly for the membership. In recent years, there's been so many opportunities to make real progress, to make real gains. And we've slipped up. Um... Yes, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and nobody is to blame. But if you take the NUT pensions dispute of 2010, there was a real opportunity. We needed to, to do something important. There was widespread uh, support for it, and the leadership introduced a series of one-day actions. But these became spread over months, and 
then sometimes year and the whole impetus fell away the initiative we had we lost and ultimately we we, we just failed to carry it home we failed to win the initiative and we're basically beaten by the government in the end and that's a very very sad it was like sort of taking out a pea shooter to them and what role did the NUT leadership play in that? Well, in my opinion, the NUT leadership did not introduce uh, a good enough strategy for leading the industrial actions. As I said, we had an opportunity. They weren't there. They didn't lead it properly. And instead, they decided to pin the blame on the membership, the membership not being up for it. And that was not the case. Believe you me, that was not the case. Um, because of that, the members, the support began to decline and it ultimately ended in a defeat. It became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, but I know for a fact it didn't need to be that way. As a result, it, it's not going to be easy to organise members for what is to come, but I know that from, for example, last spring, um, when there was mobilisation against the academisation process. Mm -hmm. That was successful. You, you've got school workers, you've got parents, you've got teachers mm -hmm. rallying for something they believe strongly in. And as a result, they forced the government into a U-turn. And increasingly, that is what might happen. We will have no choice. We will have to fight for change. The one thing I have learned through this whole process, that if you have members who are up for a fight, you have to take them into a fight. There's just no room for half-hearted leadership. And, you know, that was my conclusion of the whole thing. Well, thank you very much, Matthew, for allowing Well Read Films to interview you. And I hope you very much enjoy your retirement next summer. Excellent. Real pleasure. Nice to you, David. Cheers.